We worship a God who speaks. People agree with that, right? God is speaking. He, he has spoken in his word. He is speaking to us through creation. He is communicating to us through one another. He is always in communication with us. Um, God is sovereign. He's at work from before you were born, uh, making sure that you are here, and then working uh, through your life to put you in situations that will point you to him and give you the skills and the training and the lessons that you need for a, su- a successful life with him. Uh, A huge part of our Christian journey is learning how to hear what it is that God has to say for us. And so we spend the time studying the scriptures to hear God's word there. We spend time worshiping to understand who he is and express our heart to him. We gather in communities to listen to one another uh, and grow in that together. But um, specifically, as you're maturing in your leadership and as you step into Christian leadership, a huge part of our ability to be effective as leaders is how well we hear, we seek God and how well we hear from him and put into practice the things that he's asking us to do, right? We, We all get that. There are events in your life that God has put there to try and teach you lessons about how to hear from him. Uh, the, the big one for me, uh, if I go back in time, I'm in Scotland uh, and I've got this idea that I need to come out here to Bible college. So I, uh, I am planting a church with a dear friend out there. Things are going well. We put together this 10-year plan for what we're going to build if God would overcome every obstacle and, and, and light the way for us and what we want to do. And I remember sitting uh, with this document written down in front of us and I remember two feelings I remember being extremely excited like this is compelling like this is what I'm made for I'm thrilled by this followed by you've got seven years of bible training and then ministry experience after that I don't I've not even finished my math degree Uh, I need training if I'm going to be about this I need training and so uh, I had this moment where I felt like God was saying, you, you got to go and get some training. And so I, I'd looked around at some schools that existed near me at that time, and it felt like they were all destroying the faith of the people that I knew. And, but there was this group of Americans that I was around in Glasgow at the time, and they all seemed to really love Jesus, really respect his word, were quite zealous about their faith. And so one at a time, I'd meet with them, and I'd ask them their story, and they all told me this word, I've told you this before, right? This word, I just knew it began with an M. Um, Turned out it was this place, Multnomah. So in one of the conversations, I'm sitting with this guy and I was like, what is the name of the place that you all talk about that begins with an M? And he said, Multnomah. So I went home that night, I Googled Multnomah. I got the county before I found the Bible college. Um, But I, I Googled, I found Multnomah and I started reading the website and somewhere in the process, this is like 11 at night, Somewhere in the process of reading that website, I I think I went to bed at 2.30 a.m., having read every page, catalogs, reviews, descriptions, historical statements, listened to messages from people at the school, but I listened to all, and somewhere in the middle of that, there was this thing in me that said, this is it, this is where I want you to go, I want you to go here. So I grabbed my journal, I got down on my knees by my bed, and I wrote in my journal, God wants me to go to Multnomah. Really the first... uh, the first true experience I had of trying to discern what does God want for me and what's the path there. The path from there then looked like this. I don't know if I can hear from God. I don't know if God is telling me what to do or not. I think he is. So it went like this. Okay, God, I think you're telling me that you want me to go to Multnomah. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send in my, an inquiry. I wanted them to send me a hard copy catalog. I didn't want to look at it digitally. I wanted a print copy. I was like, I'm going to email them and I'm going to ask them to send me a print copy. If you don't want me to go, just have them say no. And so next thing you know, they email me and in the mail I get this hard copy of the thing. And I'm like, okay, that's a good sign. Okay, God, there's an application in the back of it. I'm going to fill in the application. If you don't want me to go, just have them deny the application. So I fill in the application, I send it off, I get the application accepted. And it's like, oh, I need... $21,000 in a bank account to be able to get the visa. I'm like, okay, God, this is January 1st. Sitting in my bedroom, I grab my journal, and I'm like, okay, God, this you've said you want me to go. It costs $21,000. I have negative money. Uh, So if you want me to go, I'm going to open a new bank account today, and you got to fill it with $21,000. Took nine weeks. 
I won't tell you how. Uh, <laughs> I'll leave you in suspense. Uh, and I'm like, okay, that's a pretty good sign, right? This little poor guy in Scotland with no money gets $21,000. Then it was, okay, I now got to sort out a visa. God, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to have to interview for a visa and tell them, tell these secular people that I'm going to Bible college, if you don't want me to go, just have them reject the visa. I get the visa. Um, so then it's like, okay, it's time to go. We're, we're figuring it all out. I'm at the airport. I'm on the plane. I'm like, God, it's so clear to me that you want me to go. It appears that way. If I am wrong, tell me and I won't get on the plane. Like, I want to walk in your will. So if you don't want me to go, just tell me and I won't get on the plane. I get on the plane. He doesn't tell me no. I get on the plane. I'm journaling. Like, I'm on the plane and I'm journaling. I'm like, eh, the pattern. Uh, I'm like, this is what God wants for me. I have no doubt at all that you want this for me. But I'm like, God, I want to follow you so much. If you only wanted me to come this far, just tell me. I will get off the plane at the other side and I will get on a plane and I will go straight back home if that's what you want. But I know you're speaking and I know that you're guiding me. And so I'm going to be attentive to what you're going to do. Now, some people could look at my process and go, well, that was a lot of testing God. Like you, you were putting out these tests to make sure that he would prove to you it's the right thing. It was the opposite. I was testing myself. Like I think God has spoken. I'm going to just make sure all of these obstacles in the way become the evidences that help prove that I know that God is guiding me. And I came over here and I studied and it was great. And it, it's been abundantly clear that I did the thing that God wanted me to do. That moment has been repeated multiple times throughout my life, in some senses, on a daily basis, because that was an experience God was putting in my life that was very distinct, and uh, we don't all have uh, experiences of that where God's funding you $21,000 overnight, um, but God was trying to teach me the importance of seeking his will and making sure that I was doing the things that he was asking me to do. And that set a principle for the way that I function in my life, the way Mon and I function in our family, the way that I attempt to lead the church. I don't ever want to go anywhere or do anything that God is not asking us to or giving us permission to step into. We're in this series in Joshua. We're continuing in chapter 9 today. And this is the antithesis story to what I just shared. This is the story where they should be seeking the will of God, but they don't. It's a story of trickery, of failure on the part of Israel, and, it, and, and then loads of unexpected kindness uh, in the way the story ends. So let me read Joshua chapter 9. We're going to read chapter 9 into chapter 10. Um, let's read this, and then we'll look at it in more detail. So Joshua chapter 9, now when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things, the kings in the hill country and the western foothills and along the entire coast of the Mediterranean Sea as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, hyperlinks, we're supposed to jump back to the passages earlier where they're told to wipe these guys out. He's making it clear we know who they are. They came together to wage war against Joshua and Israel. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and I, they resorted to a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn-out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. They put worn patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. Then they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the Israelites, We've come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. The Israelites said to the Hivites, but perhaps you live near us, so how can we make a treaty with you? We are your servants, they said to Joshua, but Joshua asked, who are you and where do you come from? They answered, your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we've heard reports about him, all that he did in Egypt, all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, to Sion, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. And the elders and all those living in our country said to us, take provisions for your journey, go and meet them and say to them, we are your servants, make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you, but now see how dry and moldy it is, and these wineskins that we filled with were new, but see how cracked they are, and our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. The Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. 
Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. Three days after they made the treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that there were neighbors living near them. So the Israelites set out, and on the third day came to their cities, Gibeon, Kephira, Bero, and Kiryat Yaarim. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders, but all the leaders answered, we've given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. This is what we'll do to them. We'll let them live so that God's wrath will not fall on us for breaking the oath he swore to them. They continued, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers in the service of the whole assembly. So the leader's promise to them was kept. Then Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said, why did you deceive us by saying, saying, we live a long way from you while actually you live near us? You are now under a curse. You will never be released from service as woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. They answered Joshua, your servants were clearly told how the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you the whole land and to wipe out all its inhabitants from before you. So we feared for our lives because of you, and that's why we did this. We are now in your hands. Do to us what seems good and right to you. So Joshua saved them from the Israelites, and they did not kill them. That day he made the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the assembly to provide for the needs of the altar of the Lord at the place the Lord would choose. And that is what they are to this day. Now, Adonai Zedek, the king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he'd done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and had become their allies. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appeared to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmut, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it's made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Yarmut, Lachish, and Eglon joined forces. They moved up with their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. So after an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road, going up to Beth Horon, and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makeda. As they fled before Israel on the road from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them, and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites." On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, sun stand still over Gibeon and you moon over the valley of Ailon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies as it's written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. I, I, I feel like I say every week, this story is awesome. It blows my mind. Like, I love the book of Joshua and these narratives. What we're going to do, I, just want, I want to start by zooming in on a few key elements that are here in the story that help us understand more of what's going on in the story. And after we've zoomed in on them, we're going to turn the camera at us and ask some questions about what this means for us. So the writer starts by set, he starts setting the scene by establishing a contrast um, that we kind of gloss over, but we want to stop for a moment and pay attention to the contrast established between these kings and between the Gibeonites. So it begins when the kings of the west of the Jordan heard about these things, they came together to wage war against Joshua and Israel. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and I, they resorted 
to a ruse. So as we've seen all the way through the book of Joshua so far, the writer is very clever in setting up all the way through two alternate ways that we get to interact with God and with his people. And we saw it with, we saw what it was like for Rahab as an outcast who aligns herself with the people of God. And we saw what it was like for Achan, a person on the inside who chose to align himself with the things of the world instead of the ways of God. Um, The Bible from start to finish, and especially in Joshua, is making it really clear. Either we acknowledge the truth of who God is, and we get in line with what he's asking us to do, or we align ourselves with the ways of the world, and the consequences for that are horrendous. Um, At this point, the writer is trying to create some intrigue in the story. He's letting us know a few things. The Gibeonites are Hivites which again is linking us back to this passage in the Old Testament where God has told them, I'm going to give you this land and when you go in, there's a group of people that you need to get rid of because their lives are so horrible and the sins that they're doing are so vast that they need to be wiped off the face of the earth. So he sends Israel in and the Hivites and the surrounding people are the people that they're supposed to uh, be rejecting. And so the story is setting up here. We've got this group of people, we don't know who Gibeon is, but in the story... So far, we know the Hivites are people that are supposed to be destroyed. Uh, And so why are the Hivites not joining with all the other kings to destroy Israel? Because these are the people whose land is about to be taken. And then this strange little word and language gets used in here. Rather than resort to violence and attack them, it says they resort to a ruse. I want to look at this word, element number two, the ruse. This is such, I I love that the NIV picks this word because what is going on in the background could be uh, construed as extremely negative and I love that they're a bit more neutral and almost a little more playful in the word that they chose. So we're left at this point, what is going to happen? Is Gibeon going to do this ruse to defeat Israel uh, Over and above the other kings that are there, what is this ruse about? We don't know, but we're left curious. Uh, Are they going to be destroyed? Are they going to do like happens in other places in the New Testament? Have they come up with a strategy to lead Israel astray and so bring the wrath of God down on them? Uh, What I think is really interesting, this word uh, ruse, so on the left-hand side, you get this word arma. Um, This word, when you see it, the word on the right, arum, I, I've highlighted the three letters. In Hebrew, the words always have a three-letter base. The word on the right, the first time it appears in Scripture, and when I see the word, I'm just like, uh-oh, what's going on? We would probably be better, I, I'm curious if you'll get it from this, instead of saying they resorted to our ruse, if we said the Israelites were crafty, would you know where that word came from? Genesis chapter 3, the serpent was crafty. The word is a room. So they both have the same root word. So something has gone on. There are other words they could use for deceit. Something has gone on in this story right now where the word uh, that is used in the beginning to set up the cosmic battle between God and Satan and deceiving his people and leading them astray is the word that's been used in here. So the people resort to ruse. And what we're left wondering, if, if you're reading this in Hebrew and you pick up on that word, what you're left wondering is one of two things. Is Satan behind this? Yes, right? <laughs> That he's, he's the king of deception. He's the father of lies. He loves to deceive. He loves to oppose the plan of God. But you're left going, okay, there's a ruse happening. Is Satan behind this? God has promised Adam and Eve the garden, and they're going to expand it over the face of the earth, and Satan comes in to interrupt that plan. Well, here we've got the Israelites on the forefront of the Jordan entering into the promised land. They're having victory and doing the things that God is calling them to do. We've had the blip with Achan, where he disobeys God and he steals things that he shouldn't. This passage is letting us know that Satan is still busy opposing the work of God, and the way he loves to to do it is through deceiving his people. Satan wants to deceive the people of God to stop them being able to be effective at the work that God is calling us to do. I said I'd wait till the end, but you just have to do it right now. There are things in your life right now that the enemy of your soul is doing to deceive you, to try and stop you from doing the very things that God is calling you to do. 
The question becomes, have you learned how to discern the voice of God from the voice of the enemy so when deception comes, you're able to stand against it? Or is the enemy being victorious and working ruses in your life, giving you good things that will keep you from doing the very good things that God wants you to do? We live in this spiritual battle. Whenever we are trying to follow God, the enemy will come against us. In the life of our church, where we're at right now, I'm looking at these buildings that are here and all the good things we can do to reach the community and all the great ideas people are coming at me with that we could use to do God's work here. This is the perfect time for the enemy to come in and deceive us into choosing the wrong option so that he can thwart the work that God is doing here, so that we can get busy with programs or managing tenants rather than reaching the lost in the city around about us. So we're at a point right now where I'm like, this is, this is right for us. We've got to be on alert, ready to discern what God wants so that we're not the victim of a ruse. I think the other, the other word in Scripture that is, that is interesting in English is the word shrewd. Shrewdness happens throughout Scripture, and often the situations we see are negative, but sometimes God applauds it for happening. You've got moments like that have passed already, so in in Genesis with with Jacob, deceiving his dad into thinking he's his brother because his dad's going to give the birthright and the blessing to the wrong person. So his mom helps him engage in a ruse, that makes sure the blessing happens the right way around that God had prophesied that it would happen and intend to happen. We've got things in the New Testament where Jesus is given the parable of the guy that's, that's abusing his master's money and then they're gonna, uh, he gets fired and they're going to throw him in jail. So he starts taking all the receipts and cutting them in half and blessing all the people because he's like, then when I get out of jail, I'm going to have friends. And, and God's, uh, Jesus says, like, I applaud this man for his shrewdness. So you're left wondering, in this moment, is the ruse the work of the enemy and the Gibeonites partnering in the work of the enemy and doing something really negative? Or is this the shrewdness that's applauded in the New Testament where the Gibeonites are saying, we've heard of the fame of the Lord. We've seen what he's done to other nations. We know that he's coming for our land. We know that we have been destined for destruction. And so we're going to use our shrewdness and our knowledge of God that if we make a covenant with these people that that worship a covenant-keeping God, that if we can get them to make the covenant, they have to keep the covenant and then we'll be protected under this covenant-keeping God they're looking for. Is it a ruse that's meant to destroy, or is it shrewdness that is making the most of the situation and using their ingenuity, albeit deceptively, to bring themselves under the covenant-keeping God? We're kind of left at this point in the story going, I don't know. What I do know is this word points back to Genesis 3, And whatever is happening here, the enemy of Israel, the enemy of God, the enemy of our souls is out to deceive, but God is always masterful at taking Satan's deceit and working it for his triumph. Third thing I want to look at to understand the passage so it can really hit home with ourselves is the place that's mentioned here, Gibeon. Uh, We read Bible places and it would be like me talking about Glasgow and Edinburgh and Irvine and Ayr and Troon and places at home. You're like, those sound wonderfully romantic. Uh, the shores of Loch Lomond, but it may as well be a storybook because you've never seen them. Most of you have never seen them. Uh, and some of you will never get there. Um, and that's often what happens with the Bible is we read these names and they're just names. Plucked out history, we know nothing about them. Um, In the passage, it's not until chapter 10 that we begin to understand some of the significance of this place. But let me uh, put up a couple of maps just to give you some framing of what is going on in the background that's inciting these people uh, to want to attack. So 
Uh, here's some maps of ben- Benjamin is on the left. So these are the tribes in Israel. What I want you to see, you've got the, uh, the Sea of Galilee at the top. You've got the Dead Sea in the bottom. You've got the Jordan River down the middle. We know from where we've been at in the story so far, there's two and a half tribes on the east side of the Jordan. We've just crossed over. If you uh, look at where the top uh, right-hand corner of the orange shape is that says Benjamin, that's Jericho, right on the other side of the, uh, of the Jordan. And so you've got Benjamin. I want you to notice that God has orchestrated the wandering of Israel. They've been wandering through the wilderness. God has chosen the place that they're crossing the Jordan. They could have crossed up north in Golan. They could have crossed anywhere in the middle. They could have crossed south of the Dead Sea, but God's chosen to bring them to this place and have them cross here. As they cross over into, uh, into Jericho, they enter into Benjamin. Benjamin is the part, or Benjamin is assigned the part of Israel that is really the dividing line for the nation. So the land of Benjamin controls all the movement of Israel between the north and the south, and stimmies the major place that you can cross over between the east and the west. So this is a strategic spot uh, in the map of Israel and in this land of Canaan. On the right-hand side is what we call the Central Benjamin Plateau. um, And it is a a little flat, kind of more barren area that's in, it's almost like a saddle. There's hills all around it. And it's this flat basin-like place in the middle. And if you look, you've got Mizpah at the top, Ramah in the middle, Geba on the right, Gibeah on the south, and Gibeon over on the left. Uh, Jericho at this point, if you follow uh, Michmash and go over this direction, you get Jericho up on the right. Um, This is probably the most contended piece of land in the Bible. And most, so much of the uh, action that happens in the Old Testament happens in this tiny little plot. I always look at the, the map of the world and I see Israel and I think, man, All that goes on in the world for this tiny little dot in the middle of the map, well, actually, in that tiny little dot in the middle of the map is this tiny little dot that's made up of these five places. Whoever, and you'll see it as you read through Kings and Chronicles, whoever controls towns in the Central and Benjamin Plateau controls all of the trade route north and south, all of the trade route east and west, controls the dominant access path to Jerusalem, the major city that exists in this part of the world. So God happens to bring Israel to the Jordan River. It happens to part for crossing right outside Jericho. They happen to take Jericho miraculously. They move on and they take Ai. And now, randomly, this group of people is motivated to come to Israel and engage in a ruse. Notice that Israel hasn't tried to capture Gibeon for its strategic value. Something has incited Gideon to try and trick Israel. And as a result, now Israel essentially is taking the whole road that goes from the Jordan River all the way to Gibeon, blocking north and south, and now is the political power that owns the central Benjamin Plateau that controls everything that's going on in the country. So when other people are going, this is an important city, they have strong warriors here, we should probably fight these guys. There's more going on geopolitically uh, lying behind it. And I think the thing, I've said it a couple of times already, but I think the thing that staggers me about this is, again, they didn't choose the strategy. God brings them to the point in the Jordan, parts it and brings them to this part of the land promising that they'll take the land and he starts by giving them the central place uh, from which victory is most assured. Which leads us to the problem that the passage raises, right? The Israelites sampled the provisions of the Gideonites but did not inquire of the Lord. That's the way it puts it. Let me read you Exodus 34. It's not gonna be up on the screen. This is 11 through 14. The Lord says to the nation, I am making a covenant with you The passage we're looking at, NIV says treaty. The word is covenant. Um, I am making a covenant with you. Before all people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all of the world. We've been seeing this. The people you live among will see how awesome the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. They're seeing it. 
Obey what I command you. I will drive out before you. Here's the names. The Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you're going, or they will be a snare among you. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their asher poles, do not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. When you go into the land, watch out for these people. They will try to make a treaty with you. It will lead you astray. Is it shrewdness or is it craftiness? Right. But the problem as the, in this, this story, the problem that God identifies that the writer of Joshua wants us to be really clear, and I want us to sit in this sentence for a moment. The Israelites sampled the provision but did not inquire of the Lord. God had made it so clear. And you see some of the wrestling in the passage. They know they're not supposed to make a treaty. And you see some of the wrestling that they have. And part of the irony at this moment in the story is you've got Israel making a mistake here. It seems like the Gibeonites know more about God and how his plan works than the Israelites do. I know your God is a covenant-keeping God. I know that he's promised to give you this land. I know that that victory is secure. I know that my life is on the line. But because I know how he works, and I know what we've seen him do, and they've probably heard the stories of people like Rahab, we know that when people align themselves with them, that it tends to go okay. But we've been promised for destruction. So let's just try and see if we can make them make the covenant. And then we know we're good. Is it craftiness where they're trying to trick them and lead them astray? The thing that makes me think no is all the things they're saying. We've seen the fame of your God. We know that he's promised you the land. We know that our lives have been forfeited. So yeah, there's irony here that they seem to know more in this moment than God is and they're leveraging their knowledge of God to trick Israel into allowing them to be the people that God, uh, to be part of the people that God is going to allow to stay in the land. Here's where this hits home for me. This is the, the, the way I want to word this sentence. Like the, like the Israelites in this moment, we're too quick to look to moldy bread when it comes to making decisions about what God wants to do in our lives and through us. We look at a story like this. We like to look at the story and point out Israel's big mistake. We like to look at these moments and go, well, if it was me, I would have sought the the Lord and I would never have been fooled the way they would have been fooled. But the reality is in most of the decisions that we make in our life, we look far more like the Israelites at this point uh, than we do the people that listen to the voice of the Lord. So often we look at the moldy bread and the the, the worn out sandals instead of inquiring of God and asking him what he wants to do for us. We are so used to depending on our own strength, our own ingenuity, uh, uh, the wisdom that we've learned, the things that we've studied, our human logic and reason. Those things are not bad in and of themselves, but so often we depend on those things alone rather than seeking God's face Uh, and inquiring of him what it is that he would have us do so that he can expose to us the ways the enemy is working in the background to try and deceive us and draw us away from the things that he wants us to do. It's why when we've talked about worship here, we said we're going to take a season and rather than jump into hiring, we're going to bring in different people. We're going to figure out what we want to do. We're going to take time to seek the voice of the Lord. It's why we're, we're saying with the buildings, like some people said, why don't we get a rental in there? We have seven different groups asking if they can rent space from us. Everything from one classroom to all three buildings and want to give us loads of money to do it. Um, and it's, I don't want to do it for money. I don't want to do it because it seems like they're aligned with us. I don't want to do things because it seems like a great idea. Um, it's easy to look at options on the table and look at the moldy bread, the worn out sandals and be like, oh yeah, this is a no brainer. It makes sense to bring in money. It makes sense to use the buildings. They're aligned with us. This is great. I don't want to be locked into a situation like happens in this story where Israel is now having to go to war for Gibeon because they entered into something that they shouldn't have entered into in the first place. 
For so many of us, we are too easily deceived and we don't even realize it's happening. I think the easiest place you see it is social media. How many people have read a post on social media or an article, turned to someone and is like, did you hear this? This is crazy. There's no way this can be true, but let me tell you all about it. And then you Google and you're like, oh, it wasn't true. And you're like, oh, I got all excited about nothing. Anyone ever done that? Has anyone ever shared a quote on social media that someone else has shared and then you realize it wasn't actually by the person that it claims to be? We are so easily deceived. The other ways that we're deceived, that you know, the, the addictions, the struggles we're in, we're deceived to, into thinking that happiness is found at the bottom of a beer bottle, that value is found in a bed with a stranger, that, that, uh, that keeping extremely busy is the right way to honor God. We are deceived. We're deceived when we think we can take shortcuts to growth in our spirituality. We're deceived when uh, we think money or treasure or success can give us the things that we're longing for. Um, and especially, we, I feel like in the Western world, we're anemic when it comes to our spirituality. We have no endurance in sitting with things that are difficult or painful or uncomfortable. So the more uncomfortable the situation is, the quicker we are to turn to the moldy bread for the solution rather than being willing to sit in the pain and the discomfort and allow God the time to speak. So the problem, we're too quick to look to moldy bread. We, like the Israelites, do not take the time to inquire of God. And for many of us, we've not built the habits of learning to hear his voice or the confidence that we know it's him when he wants to speak. And that leaves many of us deceived and to follow in the ways of the enemy. And here's, here's what I always have to say at these moments. What I don't want to communicate is there are people that always hear the voice of the Lord and then there's the people over here that are always looking at moldy bread. We all are always flip-flopping between the two and you have a couple of decisions that you make right and then all of a sudden you revert back to the moldy bread as the way that we're making the decisions that we should make. So when you look back on your life and you think about the decisions you've made and the ways you follow God, are your decisions made by inquiring of him? by seeing what he might be highlighting in scripture, by listening to the wise counsel of believers, by taking time in prayer and silence to discern what he might say, uh, or do you jump in using your own strength, your own ability, your own wisdom to make the decisions? Which leads me to the last thing that I wanna pull out in the story, and it's the numerous expressions of grace that are here that I think are so moving in this story. That day, uh, this verse at the end of verse 9, that day made the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the assembly to provide for the needs of the altar of the Lord at the place the Lord would choose, and that's what they are to this day. This was not, oh, you tricked us, now stay on the outskirts of the camp, the camp and do menial labor. These Gibeonites who deceived them into making a treaty of peace with them and they came with the language of, we're your servants. They said, we're going to come under you. The first time it's mentioned, it says you're going to be woodcutters and water carriers for the community. The next time it says that we're going to be woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. And as he finishes the chapter, you're going to be the woodcutters and the water, the woodcutters and water carriers at the altar of the Lord. These people are going to be serving the temple cutting down the wood that's used to burn the sacrifices that wipe the sins of Israel away. They're gonna be the ones bringing the water that fills the basins that the priests use to wash themselves so that they're pure in the presence of God. This is not like be on the outskirts of the people of God. This is come into the center and learn what it looks like to worship this God that we serve together. There's grace in Gibeon being attacked and God could have said, you made a vow that I didn't want you to make and therefore I'm not gonna help you against the Gibeonites because you made your bed now lie in it. Instead, God says, you made a vow that I didn't want you to make but because I'm a covenant keeping God, I'm gonna fight against the enemies to protect these Gibeonites because they've now been brought in to my people. You can fast forward to 2 Samuel 27 uh, where Saul is screwing up uh, masterfully all over the place. 
But there's a moment where it says there's a famine in the land for three years and David is trying to work out what the famine is for. So he inquires of the Lord and God says to him, Saul tried to wipe out Gibeon. Where decades down the line, Saul tried to wipe out Gibeon and because of the covenant that was made with them, the consequence is now famine on the land. That's grace. As you go on further in the story, Gibeon becomes one of the priestly cities in Israel. Uh, In 1 Chronicles 16, the Ark of the Covenant ends up staying in Gibeon for a season and houses the presence of God. Uh, In 1 Chronicles, when you're reading the list of the mighty men, one of David's mighty men is listed as one of the Gibeonites. Gibeon is the place in 1 Kings chapter 3 where Solomon falls asleep and encounters God and God says, what do you want? And Solomon's like, I'll give, I want wisdom. And God's like, I'll give you wisdom and I'll give you everything else. And then by the time you get to Nehemiah and they're rebuilding the wall, the scriptures are really clear. As the nation of Israel is rebuilding their section of the wall, the Gibeonites are right there rebuilding their section of the wall. The, the, Satan tried to deceive Israel was duped into believing it because they trusted in their own ability. But rather than God say, you're done, God lashes out in abundance, grace after grace after grace. I'm going to use Gibeon to give you victory over the enemy people. I'm going to protect and save Gibeon. I'm going to make this a priestly place. I'm going to bring them into the center of worship. Uh, We're going to have them in the middle of what happens moving forward. That's the God that we worship. So I didn't want to leave you thinking we're we're all too easily deceived and we're going to be screwed up. We, We are all too easily deceived. The enemy wants to trick us into doing things that keep us from doing what is God's best for us. We will get it wrong. We will make mistakes, but God is faithful that when we fail to inquire of him and we make the wrong move because we're trusting in moldy bread, that he can take all of our mistakes and as we come to him in humble repentance, we'll continue to twist those and redeem them for his good. In your life and in the history of this church, we've trusted moldy bread. We've been locked into covenants here that have not been very beneficial for us as a church at points. But God has leveraged them to give us the resources that we need and the training we need to move forward into the work that he has for us. So let me pray, and then I want to release you to uh, have a little chat and pray before we finish in worship. God, um, thank you that uh, we have this ark in Scripture. You are working for the good of humanity. There is an enemy of our souls that is out to get us through lies and deception. He tries his best, but the testimony of Scripture is that every step of the way, uh, no matter how hard he tries and no matter how much we fail, you turn it around for the sake of your plan. And so, God, with where we're at in our lives in this church, would you help us to become better at inquiring of you rather than looking at the moldy bread? Uh, God, would you help us to be people who hear your voice and act on it rather than depending only on our human wisdom? May we be people who take all that you've given us, the logic and the gifts, and, and submit it to you so we can work in partnership with you to do what needs done. And then in this season, in the life of our church, as we're discerning what is next, we need your help. Would you protect us from the enemy's deceits? Would you make us discerning as a community that we can understand together what you would have for us? All of it so that we can walk into the fullness of your kingdom and that you can release through us the salvation that you want to pour out in the community around us. Um, So God, help us to take our eyes off the moldy bread and fix it on you in Jesus' name. Amen.